Thank you very much. It's my honor to be here with what? And to see a crowd like this, I'm just over, overwhelmed. I really appreciate your coming out. I, I'll, I'll talk for a few minutes, but uh, I'm not going to read because you all can do that pretty well. I thought that I would just uh, say, you know, talk for a few minutes and then maybe we just have a conversation. I find uh, that that's at least the part that I enjoy most, just having a, a talk with folks and answer questions and just have, a, have an exchange of thoughts and ideas. And um, if I can be of any uh, help in maybe trying to make some sense of what's going on, then uh, uh, I'd be happy to try to do that and, and in, answer anything, any questions you might have about any aspect of what I've done or what's going on with health care. Um, I might start by just saying that uh, uh, it's anything but over. Uh, what we saw happen with the passage, passage and, and the President signing the bill in March, uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was in many ways maybe just the beginning, the end of the beginning uh, in terms of health care reform. It is the first time that we've gotten this far in quite a long time. It certainly falls, falls far, far short than a lot of health care reform advocates, including me, had hoped it would, would ultimately be. But it, it's something. And, uh, uh, but I say it's far from over because even today we uh, heard from Virginia that uh, U.S. District Judge Henry Hudson ruled that it's a, in his opinion uh, a provision of the Health Insurance Act that requires all of us to buy insurance from insurance companies is unconstitutional. And uh, he's, it wasn't a surprise. He, is a, he was appointed by President Bush in 2002 to the bench. And um, so it was in the, 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 the folks who were bringing this lawsuit were really hoping that he would be the judge and that's why they brought it where they did uh, to get that ruling. Uh, but he is just one of a number of judges who will be ruling on the constitutionality of this legislation. <laughs> Uh, th to give you an idea of, uh, of, of just how complex and interesting this is and, and how much is, you know, interesting it's going to be, uh, the, the health insurance industry is probably apoplectic right now because that is the last thing they wanted to see. Um, when I was testifying before Congress last year, I, I said to the lawmakers that if they passed uh, legislation that uh, had the individual mandate in it but did not have a public option, they might as well call the bill that they have passed uh, the Health Insurance Industry Profit Protection and Enhancement Act. <laughs> and, um, and of course, that's what they did. They passed it. They didn't change the name of it, but it might as well be that. Um, although, you know, to be fair, I did say just before the Senate and the House were voting on the, the final bill that Congress should pass it because uh, despite its shortcomings, despite the fact that it does guarantee these private insurance companies billions of dollars in, in revenue for, for several years to come. And a lot of those will be that a lot of that money will be trans, translated into profits for Wall Street investors. The bill nevertheless does quite a bit of good for consumers. <coughs> it does bring a lot more people into coverage than we've ever had in this country before. I hate that any more money goes to these insurance companies, but it's a system that we've got and Congress was not able to do anything better than that. Uh, which is saying something when you consider you have a Democratic president and Democrats in control of both House and the Senate. They never uh, began any serious discussion with single fare, for example. They began with a compromise, and they wound it up with less than a compromise. But as I said in a blog post I wrote, uh, we've been trying to get something significant for 100 years in this country in terms of health care reform, reform. And one of my chapters in this book is about the history of reform and how we've come up short so many times because of the power and influence of the special interest. And certainly my perspective is how they've been able to spin it to turn people away, to scare people away from reform. And they've done it every single time that it's come up. And I was a part of it in 1993 and 1994 when I was still working in the insurance industry. I was working, I just started working for Cigna, I had been with uh, Humana prior, just prior to this. Uh, I had been head of corporate communications for Humana, uh, which is one of the top five insurance companies. And I went to work for Cigna, which is an even bigger company. So I had worked over 20 years for two of the, the largest for-profit insurance companies in the country. Um, the health insurance industry was very much afraid of the Clinton health care reform plan. As at that point, were the AMA, the uh, pharmaceutical companies, the medical manufacturer, medical device manufacturers, 
uh, just about every special interest involved in the healthcare system was opposed to it for one reason or another. So they banded together. They each liked different part. They each hated different parts of the legislation, but they they realized that if they could put aside their differences, the one thing they shared in common was their dislike of the bill. If they could pool their resources, they could kill it, and that's exactly what they did with the health insurance industry taking the lead and making sure it happened. And one of the things you may recall um, that they did was finance a, an advertising campaign, a set of TV commercials that, in particular, were very effective in scaring people away from the form. It featured uh, two actors who were posing as man and wife, uh, Harry and Louise, sitting around the kitchen table talking about reform and raising issues that uh, were intended to scare us, uh, to, to, to plant doubts in our minds about the health care reform bill. And it's extraordinarily effective. It's extremely well done and, and had the intended consequence of scaring people away from reform. And I played a role behind the scenes in, in PR activities. Uh, in a campaign like that, you have several things going on. You have uh, the visible TV commercials, but you also have something going on behind the scenes that is uh, even often more effective. And that's the part that I was uh, playing. Uh, I was a, a behind the scenes uh, spin my I was someone who was working to uh, scare people away from reform and, and using public relations techniques. And that's why I wrote this book, because I don't think people really understand how we do what we do and how we are able to manipulate public opinion to influence public policy and how it's been done, not just in health insurance, but in almost every area of corporate uh, corporations. And, and when they want to uh, get something out of Congress or stop something in Congress, they, they use the techniques of, of public relations to, uh, to make it happen. And it's all unregulated. At least we have lobbying at least somewhat le uh, regulated. We, lobbyists have to register and companies have to disclose how much money they spend on lobbying. That's not the case with uh, the activities that I was engaged in, public relations activities. Um, what happens is that uh, your premium dollars and mine for years have been going in to pay not only for lobbying uh, and for advertising like Harry and Louise, but for the activities that I was a part of, uh, which I refer to in the book uh, as invisible, in, invisible persuasion. It's not uh, uh, visible like an ad is. It's not tangible like a newspaper ad is. You don't even have any idea of what's going on. Uh, I was I talked to a, uh, a group in New Jersey uh, in 2009, September of 2009. I was invited by a congressman to speak at a town hall meeting. You may remember the town hall meetings. They were uh, very raucous, and some of them were just outrageously raucous. And this was one of them that turned out to be that way. Uh, this congressman. Uh, I was holding one at Montclair State University in New Jersey, not too far from New York City. And uh, uh, the Tea Partiers were there in large numbers. Uh, and in advance of that, there was word that they were going to be there. The health care reform advocates made sure that they had a complement of people who were there. And they all were very vocal, and they were uh, trying to drown each other out. So consequently, those of us who were talking could barely be heard over that, that noise. But I was trying to explain how the insurance companies were so much involved in influencing public opinion. And afterwards, a woman came up to me, and she was just having none of it. I'm not sure she heard me, but if she did, she was not believing me. She said, no one paid me to be here. And I said, ma'am, I know. No one paid you a dime. You didn't get any money to be here. But a whole lot of money went into getting you here. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened. And, uh, uh, didn't convince her, of course, but uh, that's, that's what goes on. I talk in the, I write in the book about, to give you an example of how this works by using the story about how the insurance industry uh, tried to discredit Michael Moore as a filmmaker, and, and in particular his movie Sicko. Uh, the movie premiered at the film, uh, film festival in France in May of 2007. Uh, those of us in the insurance industry had no idea what was going to be in the movie. We had heard that it might be about the pharmaceutical industry primarily. We didn't know if we played it very close to his vest. So the insurance industry, America's health insurance plans in particular, which is the trade group and the lobbying group for the biggest one for health insurers, of which my companies are a, a member, and we pay for the membership dues, by the way. Um, you, they should be very grateful for, you, for doing that. They sent a staff member to uh, France to uh, 
sneak in, and they will actually they got him a ticket so that he can go into the movie to see it and uh, get on the phone after it was over and call back to the States. We were all waiting on a conference call for him to come on the line to tell us what was in the movie. And uh, you know, our worst fears were, were, uh, uh, were proven when he was telling us that uh, health insurers were his biggest target. And that the movie not only portrayed just how bad our situation is in this country for people who even have insurance and how, how bad they're treated and how often that treatment leads to their deaths, uh, uh, and I can attest to that myself. Uh, but also, he, he, the movie showed how, con by contrast, other countries, other developed countries, have been able to assure the citizens of universal coverage. They cover everybody, and they do it more cheaply than we do, and the quality is, is good. Uh, the insurance industry was very afraid of Michael Moore and that movie. So the insurance industry spent an enormous amount of money hiring a big PR firm at Cold Worldwide. And all of us, my peers and I, would meet on a very regular basis to develop a PR strategy to discredit the movie and Michael Moore as a person, as a filmmaker. And the target was primarily uh, the content of the movie about the other country's health care, uh, and in particular the Canadian health care system and others that are single payer systems. Because if they were to be, if that were to be enacted in this country, there'd be no need for them. They'd be actually outlawed, uh, which Canada has done. Uh, so what the industry decided to do was to mount a very uh, aggressive PR and advertising campaign to discredit Michael Moore, to uh, try to make people think that people in Canada and other other countries where they assured universal coverage, that people had to wait long, long line in long lines to get care, wait for months to get the care that they needed. <coughs> they would use anecdotes. Uh, in fact, there's one. Uh, uh, there's an organization called. Uh, the National Association of Health Underwriters, which has taken this campaign up again because they know that in, in California and in Vermont and some other places, single payers can be back on the agenda. So they're beginning this campaign again. Uh, and the allies of the health insurance industry will be, will be at this just like the insurers were uh, in the past. But uh, one of the things that the insurance industry did, using your premium dollars, was to set up a front group. Uh, actually, the PR firm that was hired set up a front group. APCO Worldwide set up this group called America's uh, America's Health what was it, the, uh, Healthcare America was the name of the front group. Uh, it's, it's easily confused with Healthcare Amer for America Now or Healthcare Now. They choose those words for obvious reasons to make you think that they are on the consumer side and that there actually could be consumers consumer involvement in these in these groups. But they are truly fake groups. They're front groups. They are. Uh, often uh, called astroturf groups because there's no no reality to it in terms of consumer involvement. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this organization was had one person on the payroll, and she had been a, she had been someone who had been involved in this kind of work before to try to trash healthcare reform. The, the media contact was a guy who I know, and he was an employee of the PR firm. Uh, he was if you call the number of Healthcare America to speak to Bill Pierce, you'd reach Bill, but he would be at his desk at EPCO Worldwide, not uh, Healthcare America. And the address that they gave on the tax forms was uh, uh, an address at the uh, Willard Office Building in Washington, D.C., which is a, a real building, but the address they gave is a virtual office. Uh, you probably have seen something you want to talk about. They have a receptionist, and uh, you can get mail there. You can go take your, your messages, but there's no there there. There's, there's no there's no real operation, but they but that's the way that they can have a an address, uh, so that people if you look at the website will think well there is really something there. Well there really wasn't, uh, but they they were able to uh, through Apco Worldwide generate a lot of press releases uh, criticizing the movie and. Going after the other healthcare systems using anecdotes and, and some selective use of, of data to uh, discredit the movie. And also Michael Moore. And one of the things that we did during the campaign uh, was to make sure that whenever we were asked about Michael Moore, we would always call him, oh, that Hollywood entertainer, Michael Moore. Uh, and we would use language like that to try to convey this was not a serious filmmaker, but someone who was part of Hollywood entertainment, and that he was uh, out just making a movie that uh, 
was out of the mainstream of American thought. And, uh, and, and, and the uh, mainstream media bought it. Uh, even the New York Times wrote a story about Sicko that quoted uh, Healthcare America and didn't even question that he was, who was behind it. So what you have is a, a media that is a, pretty much a willing accomplice, sometimes unwittingly, uh, to this deception. And I know that from the years that I spent uh, as a top PR executive. Uh, I will end with uh, a couple of thoughts here. One, I'll go back to the, to the idea of what's happening in the courts. The health insurance industry, as I said, I think the executives were, were probably very upset with today's ruling. They, they had to anticipate it. Uh, but because they do not want this bill declared unconstitutional. At least they don't want that part of it. That is their very favorite part. Uh, they, they wanted that, and they wanted the public option stripped out, and they got both of those. Job one was to make sure that the uh, individual mandate was in there, and job two was to strip out the public option. So they got both of those. They don't like a lot of the consumer protections uh, that are in the bill, which made it worth voting for in the first place. They do not like the provision that requires them to spend at least 80% of what we send them in a premium dollars on medical care. They don't like the fact that... Uh, they now have to sell insurance to everybody, or soon will, regardless of whether you've had a pre-existing condition in the past. They don't like the fact that, that they now have to uh, provide coverage for young people at age 26 and keep them on their parents' uh, uh, loyalty. They don't like all of that. They don't like being. They don't like the additional regulations that make them behave a little bit more consumer-friendly and that makes illegal some of their practices that should have been made illegal a long time ago. So they were very active in electing Republican members of Congress. Uh, they fare much better under a Republican administration. They, during the Bush years, they, uh, they had pretty much had their way with public policy in Washington. Uh, there was an enormous amount of mergers and acquisitions. We've seen a huge consolidation in the industry to the point that it is now dominated by seven very large for-profit insurance companies, two of which I uh, work for. Uh, one out of every three Americans is now enrolled in a medical plan uh, offered by one of these. We have the illusion of choice in this country. Uh, yeah, we, we still have uh, Blue Cross of California and the Blue Cross, but it's owned by WellPoint, as you undoubtedly know. It's part of the Big Seven. Uh, Blue Shield is still independent, but the, the trend has been for these companies to convert to for-profit status and to be bought up by uh, these big corporations like WellPoint is. It's a big holding company. When I joined Signet, hardly anyone had ever heard of WellPoint or United, which is uh, the other gigantic one, the two huge ones, WellPoint and United. Uh, and they got that way in a very short period of time by uh, buying up smaller companies, and they have just become BMS. And uh, the industry is, is now uh, dominated by these companies, and they can call the shots in Washington, and certainly in the Trade Association. Uh, but they they helped elect this Republican congressman, Congress, and uh, they, they were just fine that they were in their campaign rhetoric saying we want to repeal and replace this legislation because they thought it was fine to keep scaring people and to keep turning people away from the war. And we've seen that happen. We've seen public opinion turn against this legislation, against reform uh, as in general because of the demagoguery, the lies that they've been telling. They call this the Republican state, the government takeover over the health care system to use one of their favorite terms that came straight out of the insurance industry. I have craft terms like that. Uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, they would have an easier time with it if a Republican Congress would be, you know, to, to be sworn in, as it will, obviously, in the House uh, in just a few weeks. Um, what, they, what will happen, though, uh, is that the, the, the Republicans will, in the House, will hold hearings. They will... Uh, uh, I'm sure Secretary Sebelius will be spending a heck of a lot of time on Capitol Hill uh, before very unfriendly uh, committee chairs. Uh, the administration will have, it, will have to defend this legislation in ways they've never had to do, do it before. Uh, the insurers, on the other hand, will have a very friendly uh, panel to, to appear before, uh, as will other special interests. So we're going to see a big show, but it will be sound and fury because the insurance industry is probably already talking to these guys and saying, look, here's the deal. We like the individual mandate. We like this bill. So forget about repealing it and replacing it. If you have to vote on it to repeal it here in the House, that's fine, because we know uh, the Senate won't pass it that way. They will not pass repeal. And even if they did, the President would veto it. 
So go ahead and do what you got to do because you know it's going to be, be meaningless anyway. And, and as you're doing it, it may you may be able to turn even more people away and be able to scare people away, <laughs> uh, scare people into thinking that the consumer protections are not worthwhile. So that is the objective. The objective is not to uh, uh, kill or repeal the bill. It is to eviscerate it, to take out the consumer protections and to take out the, the regulations. That's what they're going for, guys. So you've got to pay attention to what's going on. My only point is that we've got to pay attention not just what's going on in healthcare because what I write about here is going on in, in, in almost every other aspect of, of our society. Uh, and with the Supreme Court decision early this year that uh, enables corporations to uh, behave like individuals and, and donate money to campaigns uh, uh, without any any legal restrictions whatsoever, uh, the, the balance of power is shifting even more. Uh, when I, I was a reporter uh, in the uh, in the 70s, and, and there were, uh, at that point, uh, uh, there were obviously a lot of PR folks, but not nearly as many <coughs> as there are now. What has happened over the last few years as newsrooms have been folding, and, and or newspapers have been folding, and newsrooms have been uh, reduced uh, through layoffs, is that we have far fewer uh, trained reporters who are practicing journalism in this country. A lot of them are doing like I did, you know, going into PR, making a lot more money. Um, uh, to the point now that you have far, far, far more PR people uh, working for corporations than you do journalists who are trying to cover them and, and investigate them. Uh, we've, we've almost lost investigative journalism as a, as a consequence. So this alarms me, and it should alarm all of us. We need to know how this is being done. I've got one chapter in a book called The Playbook, uh, which kind of walks you through how they do this, how they get their way in terms of manipulating public opinion to influence public policy. It's very sinister, I feel like the dark arts of PR. Uh, I'll end on this, I, I'm not trashing a profession entirely because I, I still think that PR people can do a lot of good and a lot of PR people do work ethically. But there are a lot, and, and the very biggest corporations and the very biggest PR firms that absolutely not. And it's all about the money. Uh, these folks will do whatever their bosses say or their clients say to get the job done. It's all about, at the, at the end of the day, satisfying Wall Street. Uh, during the debate, uh, again, we kept hearing that this is a government takeover of the healthcare system. What in reality has been going, going on is that while we were not paying attention, we had a Wall Street takeover of our healthcare system. And that should scare us, it should alarm us, and it should make us make sure that we are staying engaged and really watching over what happens. Uh, watching the implementation of this legislation and getting active and writing letters to the editor, writing op-ed pieces if you can do that, calling your, your lawmakers, your legislators, your state legislators, your, your members of Congress. Make sure that they know who you are and that you are interested in what's going on here because rest assured they will gin up these astroturf organizations to, to give the appearance of a lot of opposition to, to reform. And uh, if we don't stay engaged, uh, we're just going to lose the whole ball game. I'll end with that, and uh, we can we can just have a conversation from this point. On. I saw your hand go up first over there, sir. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I've always been curious about this. I don't know whether you have any uh, knowledge about this, but in terms of the overall international wealth from corporations to the banking industry, what percentage of that is controlled and, and owned by the uh, insurance company? I don't really know the answer to that. I know that the insurance companies, uh, a lot of their the income, uh, they, they operate a lot on the float. If you you, you uh, pay your, your claims and uh, you pay your uh, your premiums, if you get sick, uh, they often are late in paying their claims, or the claims that they're, that go with it. In other words, they have a lot of money that they can invest, and they always are investing in a lot of different uh, corporations uh, globally. So uh, a lot of their income comes from, uh, from investments. But I don't know. I can't tell you a percentage. But they, you know, th there's a lot of uh, 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 co-ownership. There are a lot of uh, uh, in the, in the insurance industry. The insurance companies are not owned largely by individual investors. The, the, the vast majority of their stock, 80% uh, <coughs> and almost up to 100% of some of them, almost, are institutional investors. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but 
the United States government is supposed to pay 80% of the bills that they allow, the amount that they allow. So if I go to a doctor and he wants $100, they'll allow 50, and they'll pay 80% of that. And then they'll say the uh, secondary that most of us are buying from the public company, private the insurance companies. Um, they only have to pay the extra little 20%. However, they charge us almost $300 a month. Mm -hmm. so it can't work if the government is paying 80% on $100, less than $100, and the private insurance companies are getting almost $300 to pay the little bitty 20%. Mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody realizes that sort of yeah, it's, it's quite a racket. They're making an enormous amount of money on Medicare <laughs> supplement policies and also the Medicare Advantage uh, plans, uh, the, the so-called Medicare replacement plans that the companies, the, my companies and others uh, have been, uh, this goes back to the, the Bush years, this latter thing I'm talking about, the Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, the Republicans <coughs> have wanted for a long time to privatize Medicare and they thought that by enticing uh, the private insurance companies into the program through these Medicare Advantage programs that uh, they could get that job done. Uh, it hasn't worked entirely as they thought it would do. Uh, about 20, I think about 20, maybe not quite 25 percent of uh, Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in a private plan, one of these Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, the, the government is overpaying them about $12 billion a year just to keep them in the, in the business. They want to keep them in there. One of the things this legislation does will reduce that overpayment. And you may have seen some ads, I'm not sure if they ran here or not, but they ran in a lot of places around the country with this organization, again, the front group called the 60 plus organization. Uh, and uh, they were trying to scare you into thinking this legislation will reduce benefits, and it will not reduce benefits. It will reduce the overpayments that the government is making to the private companies. It actually will help Medicare beneficiaries, and it will begin to cover. Um, uh, preventive care, and it will begin to close that donut hole that is a feature of the, the drug benefit. Um, yeah, if you uh, if you have a Medicare drug benefit, after you reach a, a certain point, after the government's paid a certain amount of money for your drugs, you fall into this donut hole in which there is no coverage. My parents, my dad died recently, but until uh, he died when my mother is still alive, they both at this point in their lives are having to take a lot of medications. And uh, they have gotten into this donut hole. And they have to spend uh, each $4,550 double on pockets, which, you know, for, for them is a total of over $9,000 before the benefit will kick back in. Uh, that's not a very good drug benefit, if you ask me, for, especially for senior citizens who are on a fixed income and cannot afford and are and having to take expensive medications. Uh, so this legislation will eventually close that so that you will have comprehensive coverage without falling into the so-called donut hole. But uh, the insurance companies have been able to uh, scare people into thinking that the, the legislation will reduce Medicare benefits. They've got one heck of a racket going. They make an enormous amount of money on the Medicare supplement policies that you have and for the very reasons you cited uh, and uh, for the, uh, with these Medicare Advantage plans as well. It's quite a quite a sweet deal it got going. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, how much exposure have you been receiving Repeat the question. Uh, how much exposure have I been getting from the mainstream media? Yeah, I mean, as far as speaking about, you know, you're being successful, yeah. Actually, I have, but not as often as I'd like, but I have been, so I, you know, I give them credit for that. I was on the Fox and Friends morning show on the day before Thanksgiving. Um, I, and I hope to go back. Uh, I, I, in fact, I, I'm hoping to talk to more uh, conservative organizations and groups uh, than I, I had a chance to. Uh, but I will, whenever I'm invited by Fox, I'll go on. I haven't been invited to be on Bill O'Reilly or Glenn Beck, and I probably won't. But uh, I'm not sure I would do that. But, uh, but I might. But, uh, 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 the mainstream media has not, uh, by and large, uh, acknowledged me as much as, as uh, some of the cable uh, networks. I mean, MSNBC has had me on quite a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And I've been on CNN a number of times. And I have been on some of the network shows, 
but not so much as a result of the book. But, but I guess they're waiting to see if it's really going to catch on, and, and who knows? Maybe with this ruling, it'll explain more. And since you're in PR, yeah. you can yeah. promote yourself, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing. I'm doing the best I can. Yeah. Uh, after the when the new Congress uh, is sworn in, uh, we will have a renewed focus on this. Right now, people are not paying a whole lot of attention, and it will be back in the mainstream media again. And I suspect things will be going to change. And uh, my book tour will continue at least through the end of January. So I expect uh, uh, maybe things will start changing then. I am getting caught. You know, I was quoting the New York Times the day before yesterday in the story. Uh, so I'm I'm in the, the mainstream media occasionally, but but not as much as I am on MSNBC. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'll go. First of all, I want to thank you for the courage that you had. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll try to address all those. But you had to remind me. I'm getting old, but I don't get all three of them. Um, I was scared to death before I did this. I did expect retaliation. I know how these companies operate. I know we're talking about a lot of money, you know, billions and billions of dollars every year that's at stake just for the insurance industry alone. Um, and, you know, of course, I've been a part of the, their practices that involve dirty tricks in the past. And I know that they wouldn't stoop to, you know, I saw them how they tried to discredit Michael Moore, so I was expecting them. Well, the same kind of a treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but not as but not as much as I thought, and I think uh, a couple of reasons for that. They know that I'm telling the truth, and they know that since I was in the industry as a spokesman for the industry for as long as I was, they really would have an awkward time trying to discredit me because I was speaking for them. I had to know how they operate. One of the things that I did for ten years was handle financial communications for Sigma. So I know how these companies make money, and they know that. And uh, uh, my name is still, if you go and look on Sigma's website at the old press releases, you'll see my name on many, many, many news releases, and you can't go back and, and erase those. So they've, they've got uh, uh, that problem. The other is they've, uh, they're they afraid of giving me uh, any acknowledgement. The more they acknowledge me, the, the, the longer I will um, you know, have a half-life or something, I guess, I think. Uh, so, uh, uh, they, they, they've been they, they're, they're, I, I was talking to a reporter who um, has who covers the health insurance industry and he said that, that their posture is that you don't exist, that I don't exist and that, that makes sense, I would give them the same advice if I were still there <laughs> and so they're following what I would, what I would and we you know what would be the, the, I think the appropriate PR uh, 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 policy to be but it was very scary, and I think the reason there have not been others who've done this, because it's too scary. Uh, uh, we live lives uh, that are based on, based on fear. Uh, we're afraid of doing things. We're afraid of taking chances. And um, we certainly are afraid to do things that will um, really put our families in jeopardy. And I knew that I was doing that, not just myself. And I wavered back and forth before I finally did this, because I... I, I knew it wasn't just me I was um, putting at risk, it was my family. So I talked to them quite a lot and made sure that they understood what the possibilities were in terms of um, retaliation. And I, I, you know, I knew that I would never work in a corporate job again. Uh, I can't say I'm heartbroken about that. Uh, I thought that I would probably be able to do some consulting work to some extent, but I didn't know that for a fact. I really left without having a job to go to or really uh, a real plan. I just knew I couldn't keep doing what I was doing. But um, you know, I, I just was, a, I guess, somewhat of a person of faith, and and I, I talked to a lot of friends. In fact, clergy before I did this, uh, uh, and uh, just some just some buddies uh, and friends. One of whom said, as I was wavering and but wanting to do it, and afraid that I would not be able to work again. He said, well, "Can you at least push a broom?" And I said, "Sure." And, and that that just kind of 
cut to the chase for me. I, I might not be able to work for a corporation, and I undoubtedly won't make as much money as I was, but I can probably do something. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed with health, good health, and uh, um, so I figured I could probably do something. Um, I also read a lot. I took, it was about a year after I left my job at Cigna before I started speaking out. And I, uh, I didn't think that I would ever do what I'm doing, to tell you the truth. Not when I left Cigna. I thought that maybe I could work behind the scenes to advise progressive organizations and healthcare reform advocates to give them some idea of what to expect and maybe how to develop their own plans. But uh, it just happened that uh, that I was told that if I really wanted to make an impact, I'd have to do this in a public way. And I was introduced to the folks in Jay, uh, Senator Jay Rockefeller's staff and his Commerce Committee. And he invited me to uh, testify before his committee. And about the same time, I was invited to uh, go uh, meet with Bill Moyers and his staff in New York. Uh, and those things came close together. And I guess uh, uh, it just became inevitable that I would, would do this. Uh, and I just let things go. Uh, I just said, uh, you know, I, I, I knew when I gave that testimony, the very minute I started speaking that my life would change forever. I didn't know how. I was prepared for the worst case scenario mentally, uh, but I didn't know what that was actually looked like. But it's been actually the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And I, I, I tell this story because I just want people to understand that we are always so afraid of taking big risks for fear of losing a, a lot, but primarily losing stuff. Uh, and I just came to the conclusion that, you know, I've got a lot of the stuff, I've accumulated a lot of stuff, I'm now at that stage of trying to get rid of stuff, <laughs> and I think a lot of us are. It's not all that valuable to me anymore. I can live without it, and live probably happier without it. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I had a good job. Uh, uh, with a nice title and a pretty good income, but that wasn't what defined me. In fact, I was being defined by that, that job in ways I was not at all proud of. So, um, uh, I, 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 if, if, if anything that I've done is uh, an example, I would certainly hope that people would think that um, if, there are, if, they, if they're on the job and they, they are being asked to do something they don't think is ethical, to do something about it. Uh, Try to do something from within if you can. I tried that to a certain extent, but I knew ultimately that, that was not going to succeed because Wall Street is, is really in control. You have to do whatever it takes to satisfy Wall Street. Uh, uh, but be prepared to change jobs. Be prepared to change your life. Uh, and, and don't be afraid of change to the point that you stay stuck in a job or a career that you are not happy with. I mean, life, life is short. Uh, it's very short. One of the exercises I did, another friend suggested that you did, is uh, you may have done this as well. Uh, he said, imagine you're in a, 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 a hot air balloon, and you're, and this is metaphorical, and you're, you're rising up and you can see uh, your life behind you, like how you lived your life, and you can even see your life ahead of you, and uh, uh, you can't do anything at all about what's behind you but you may have some ability to change what is ahead of you. And uh, so what are you going to do? Uh, and you will soon, at some point, be on your deathbed, and soon as the operative word here, we're, we're not here for very long. Uh, uh, do you want to be on your deathbed and, and just think that you might have done something differently that could have made a difference and didn't do it? And uh, that haunted me. It really did. The other thing is that I made the mistake of picking up uh, the book um, Profiles and Courage, again, to read. Um, uh, and I read a lot uh, of, of books just as I was trying to decide what to do. One was uh, Sir William Grant's, Grant's book that's not nearly as uh, important, but it was it was one that, that, that caught my attention. Screw it, just do it, was the name of the title. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what it was. But uh, uh, Robert Kennedy wrote the foreword to this edition of the book that I had, and he said, that one of the president's favorite quotes was a Dante quote uh, that uh, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of moral crisis maintain neutrality. And it's probably a, a very loose translation of what he actually said or wrote. But that sure got my attention too. And I, uh, when I saw that, I thought, well, all the signs are indicating for me to do something that I haven't done before and I don't want to go 
go to Hot's place. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Oh, well, number three here in California. That's right. Uh, what I am doing is, I think, possibly. I, 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 I am not advocating, and never have advocating, advocated for a certain kind of reform. I just want to make sure that people are aware of truth. And, and, and aware of what's going on to the neighborhood public opinion in particular. Uh, but also, uh, the thing, and I, today I, I had a, a good long conversation with a, uh, a woman who's the executive director of Physicians for National Health Program, and I've spoken to her group a lot. And uh, uh, I, I, my, what I, when I have conversations with her and others, is read this book, and she has, uh, know what you're up against. You need to know your enemy. You need to figure out uh, what they have done in the past and what they likely will do to try to thwart your efforts again. And I've, I've said that you know the, the, the fact that the legislation to enact a single payer in the state has succeeded twice but been vetoed twice, uh, the insurance industry felt fairly confident that uh, Governor Schwarzenegger would veto it. So they didn't have to, they didn't think they had to bring in the heavy artillery to keep it from passing the first part. Jerry Brown, Governor, it's an entirely different, different ball game. So, uh, uh, you can be assured that they will pay attention a lot more at this time, and they will. They, they do not want a single state to become single payer. Uh, Vermont on the East Coast is uh, another state that uh, uh, the single payer advocates think might be a good place. It's a small state uh, with a governor who has advocated a single payer system in the state. Uh, but it's even as small as Vermont is, they'll they'll bring in the heavy guns to try to keep that from happening. You just need to know what they're going to be doing. And and one of the things I want to do going forward is to be a journalist again and to bring some exposure to what's going on. Make sure people are aware of the tactics that they're using. And and I think that can help people who are advocating for reform and single payer uh, uh, to 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 make sure that there is some knowledge. One of the things that again, that uh, uh, has been so difficult for single-payer folks is that the insurance industry and others have been successful in, in defining what it is in terms that is really that, that is not really correct. Uh, you don't want that to happen again. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of uh, conditioning the public to, to helping the public understand what it is you're advocating for. You need to figure out how to connect with people emotionally, not just give people facts and figures because that's not going to cut it. You need to uh, be able to tell anecdotes and stories because that's what they do to be so successful. Yeah. Yes. Just a follow follow back to follow following up on what you were just saying, George Lakehoff talks a lot about language yes. and actually um, try to get Nancy Pelosi to um, use some of the techniques that mm -hmm. have been proven to work. Right. And for some reason, the Democrats are really resistant to using those kinds of techniques in language. Um, in fact, the only time that they did was when they fought off the Social Security privatization. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts on why Democrats don't, won't um, use language in that way, you know, succinctly, a phrase, stick to it. Instead of just wishy-washy all over the place, Barbara. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I put it this way. Why are their spin monsters better than our spin monsters? Well, they are. They are. They really are. And it's because uh, uh, I think the Democrats yeah, don't... It's, pay. it's about pay. Well, it's about pay. The Democrats have money. It's, 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 uh, uh, and there are people like George Lakoff who provides good, solid advice, just like Frank Luntz does for the, for the Republicans. It's just not heated. Uh, it, it's just baffling to me. I kept waiting during this campaign, I even during the, uh, the, the debate, for the Democrats to start getting it. Yeah, and I, you know, I thought, well, the president, he really uh, went into office with a, a significant mandate because he was an incredible communicator, and he persuaded us that he would be the right man for the job, and he persuaded us in. in with rhetoric, with language, uh, he knew how to do that. He he was a, he's a cool guy, but he also knew how to uh, communicate with us in ways that resonated emotionally. And, and and President Obama seems to have lost that ability, or at least his staff seems to not care or give him that counsel these days. And uh, the uh, the Democrats in Congress 
Before uh, the House and the Senate voted on this legislation, Senator Claire McCaskill of, of uh, Missouri was quoted, uh, and, and I saw this interview on MSNBC, uh, she was asked, uh, well, what happened? Why did the Senate uh, wind up having to vote for a bill that didn't have the public option? And she said, we lost the messaging battle. And she's exactly right. That's, that's at the core of what we have going on here. They just, my observation with progressives is that they're smart people, but too smart for their own good to a certain extent. They, they think that they, that if you explain something to people rationally, they'll, they'll they of course will line up behind you and, and do what, you know, they'll, they'll get it. They'll get it. But people's eyes begin to glaze over when you just hit them with facts. But if you come up with a term like, this is the government take over the healthcare system, and you repeat it over and over and over again, uh, people are going to start believing it, just as they believe, a lot of people still do, that the bill uh, has, uh, it creates death penalty. People believe that. You, but we have them already. You have them already, you, exactly. You have them already. Um, it's baffling to me. I cannot tell you. I, I talked to Pelosi's staff. Uh, uh, you know, I think she did a terrific job, as far as it goes, to get what we got done in the House. It was a much better bill than what the Senate passed, but it still wasn't great. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you know, single pair advocates, bless them, have not done a very good job either of explaining what it is to people and and, and why people would would benefit under a single pair system. I, I've talked to a lot of folks who who who've done feasibility studies and who could uh, give you uh, rings of facts about why it makes sense, but. Uh, you know, they've been at it for many, many years, and we've, we're not much closer to getting a single pair of scissors than we really were. A lot of reasons, and, and I don't want to be uh, too unduly critical of, of, of other folks because it's awfully hard. Democrats, too, uh, someone the other day said it, it, the Republicans are like dogs and the Democrats are like cats in terms of trying to herd, uh, uh, you know, herd the, 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 the members of the, the caucus. Or, or the, the people who vote for Democrats, or their leaders, that they, they're less willing to be led uh, and to get with a program and, and, and use language than Republicans have been. That seems to be true, because uh, when the House, just an example, when the House did vote on its version of the legislation, just about every single Republican got up to denounce the bill, and almost every single, and I've read the, the transcript, they called it a government takeover of the health care system, uh, they, they understand this. They understand that you can tell these lies and use these terms and people are going to believe it. And Democrats don't seem to understand you don't have to lie. You just have to use the techniques of communications and linguistics that the, Demo that the Republicans would use so effectively. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I would like to know, the humor spin my for saving is your conscience disagreeing with you at all? Are you aware of, or, or just all caught up? Yeah. Well, it did toward the end of my career. Um, in the early part, not so much, because I I didn't really know as much as I ultimately did know as what goes on at the upper levels of these corporations and, and what they have to do to, to meet Wall Street's expectations. Uh, when you're kind of in the trenches for these companies or at lower levels, you don't really understand what, what's really going on. I kind of put it this way, you can't see the forest from the trees. You, you're involved in your own jobs uh, and you can feel pretty confident that you're doing something that helps some people and it does. You, you, can, you can go home and, and believe that and knowing that that is true for a lot of people. Uh, but you're, 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 you're not able to see what really goes on at the industry level and, and understand that the practices of these kind of companies have, have uh, made it um, uh, made it impossible for a lot of people to get insurance, uh, and, and it's a direct reason why we have so many people who are uninsured and a growing number of people who are underinsured. Uh, I became increasingly uncomfortable about uh, um, speaking for industry and companies that were moving us into the new kinds of benefit plans they want us all to be in these days. Uh, I, I became increasingly worried. Uh, that uh, uh, they were moving more people into limited benefit plans. My company, Cigna and Aetna, uh, bought uh, 
two smaller companies that specialize in these mini med or in the benefit plans that are real off of this junk insurance. They make a lot of money off of them. And that trouble. Uh, they they were putting these off as a solution to people who don't have insurance that at least they can afford to buy these new benefit plans. But there's often so limited that uh, you might as well be often you'd be better off if you were not insured. Uh, and you're sending premium dollars uh, to these companies and, and helping the shareholders get get richer. Uh, the other uh, other kind of plan are the high deductible plans that they're moving this into. And uh, uh, they were saying initially that we, as a as consumers of healthcare, need to have more skin in the game. That uh, we we've, we've been too isolated from the real cost of healthcare. And there's some merit to that, but if you make $25 million a year as an executive, you've got a lot more skin to give up than someone who, you know, the median household income in this country is just around $50,000, which means that most households, even half the households, are less than that, many much less than that. So uh, a lot of folks who are moving into these plans, they become automatically uninsured if they get sick, underinsured, because uh, uh, they can't afford to go to the doctor, uh, they can't afford to pick up their medications, and and I saw the consequences of that. I've been watching these companies this year, uh, the first three quarters of this year, they, they announced record profits. It's just been obscene. I've never seen anything like it. I handled financial communications for 10 years, and uh, I know how much these companies are expected to make on Wall Street. They've been blowing Wall Street's estimates out of the water. And the reason is, and they've been doing this at a time when we're struggling in the, in the economy, uh, when more and more people are, we've now got 51 million people about who are uninsured, the highest it's ever been, uh, and you've got uh, more and more people who are underinsured, and and, and they're they're making these this money this way because they're shifting more and more of this into these categories. Uh, they don't have to spend very much in claims as they used to, so they're they're taking advantage of us and, and making Wall Street investors uh, much much richer. So we, know, we have time for one question. Oh, I said okay. I mean, you pick one. You pick. <laughs> okay, you in the green. All right, thank you. Um, sort of a two-part question. One, uh, to your knowledge, are we the only Western industrialized nation that based medical insurance on employment rather than residence? Yes. Second, uh, how close do you think we are to ever getting a at least a two-part system where you get at least a basic government medical, and then on top you supplement it with a, uh, a private system, such as Australia or Germany. I mean, I lived in Canada for 33 years. That is the extreme of our system. Right. You do not want it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying, at least they have a two-part system. They do. Are we anywhere near that? Yeah, actually, I think we are. And uh, and I understand if you live in Canada. You know, I, I, that's why I don't advocate for a particular kind. I don't really know what would work in the best of this country. We've got a, a, a very distinct, you know, different countries. Big the, the demographics are, are quite different from anybody else's. Uh, but... Uh, uh, our, our system developed sort of like sort of like topsy in, in the, the employer-based system, and no other country does it quite like we do. We're so dependent on the employer-based or, or an employer-based system. Some, in some countries, you, you do uh, get your coverage through your employer, but it's quite different. Uh, uh, the insurance companies that compete in, com in countries where there is competition among insurers, they're all nonprofit, and there's significant regulation. And there is a, uh, a a very substantial minimum benefit package, and this legislation will is try to move us toward that kind of a, a system. Uh, it will uh, require the creation of what is referred to as an essential benefits package. Uh, it hasn't been defined yet. That's up to the Department of Health and Human Services to define. That will be coming up before too long. It has to be defined before the exchanges are up and running. Before we're all required to buy insurance in 2014. Um, what, what I think may happen is that if this legislation is implemented as, as Congress intended, intended, uh, then then Wall Street will not be able to get the returns on their investments that they have been able to get. Uh, these companies will have to give up some of the practices that have enabled them to make money hand over fist for investors. They, by not being able to exclude people because of pre-existing conditions, they'll have to take more people on who are sick and who actually need insurance and need coverage. Uh, this is a baffling system we've got that the people who need coverage the most are usually the ones who can't buy it uh, at any price at, at, at sometimes. So 
if it moves as I as I think it can, uh, the these big insurance companies, uh, the investors will tell them that this is not the best place for them to make a buck, and they'll want them to move to something else, maybe supplemental products like you see in other countries, uh, and, and and the basic medical benefit plan will be a, a commodity, uh, and there won't be much. Um, that they can profit on that. So they'll be looking for other places to make a buck. Cigna is already making more and more money abroad, uh, selling supplemental products. Uh, uh, even in China, they sell uh, cancer insurance in China. They're very big now <coughs> throughout Asia and in, in Vietnam. And, and they're, they're all data companies. They have enormous amounts of data. And they, call them, they do not call themselves in, uh, insurance companies or managed care companies anymore. They're, they're health services companies or something else like that. So. The companies have evolved, they've changed drastically since I went to work for them in 1989. Uh, and I think we'll see even more rapid evolution of our health care financing in this country to the point that I believe that these, these big companies will, will get out of the business of providing basic insurance and leave that maybe to the nonprofits. And, and they can, because they'll figure out there's a better, another place to make a buck and satisfy Wall Street more. Well, thank you.